Hello, welcome back to Scripture Central. We're so happy to be able to talk about the scriptures with you today. I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson, and this is... I'm Jack Welch, and very happy to be with you, especially on this day when we can talk about Jacob. Jacob chapter 5, 6, and 7. And be sure to check out more videos about this topic on Scripture Central, such as an interview I recently did with David Seeley. Jacob chapter 5 is the longest book in the Book of Mormon, but there's so much more than length here. This is one of the greatest evidences of the Book of Mormon. It's one of the greatest messages. It's sprinkled all little bits of it. Ideas are all over the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, all the way down through Jeremiah. So we believe it was part of the brass plates, but it's not Jacob's allegory. It's Zenos' allegory, and that's why we see it so frequently there. The allegory of the olive tree has roots that go deep into Israelite literature. There are places in the Old Testament that talk about the olive tree and how it symbolizes Israel, but they're very brief. Uh, There are references in Ezekiel and uh, in Jeremiah. Exodus 15, verse 17, talks about how God will plant this plant, a precious plant, And there's nothing more precious than an olive tree. It produces fruit, but it needs to be tended. And the fruit is used for so many purposes. Uh, The oil, of course, is pressed. And the first pressing, the oil is very pure. It's used in the temple. It's used in the temple as Anointing. anointing oil. It's used for food, cooking oil. Well, it's also used for an ointment and lotion. And after they've pressed the, uh, the oil pits and gotten as much out of the, uh, the, the olives as you possibly can, they will even take the pits and make briquettes. And, of course, they're filled with olives. But that's all in the ancient world. Um, so the olive oil is not mentioned in this allegory. It's more about the fruit. But I think it's good to think of it in that light because the olive oil for anointing and nourishment and and healing of the body and as our light are all types of Christ. I see the olive is such a beautiful imagery, not just for the house of Israel, but for our Savior's influence in our life if we're going to look at the olive oil. The olive, I think, can symbolize a lot of things. Uh, one is that an olive tree takes a lot of care. If you let an olive tree just grow, it reverts to its wild state. What we know from the genetics and botany of olive trees is that long, long ago, olive trees simply grew wild. And the fruit that they bear as wild trees... It's bitter. Is, is, it's bitter, and it's not only bitter, but it's very uh, pulpy and not much fruit. You, you really can't get much out of it, not much oil or other food value but you have to cultivate them in order to get the good fruit. That's right. So it's a perfect image that the Lord wants to use here. And not only do you have to cultivate, I mean, just in general, but there's a science to when you cultivate. And we can talk more about this sort of thing, but it's very high value uh, activity. And if you had an olive orchard, you would have servants and workers who would help you, and you would go out and you would tend this. You don't want it to become too dry or too wet. You don't want weeds to grow. You, you must prune it carefully. Well, in the allegory, who are the, the, those people? You know, we've got the master, we've got the servant, we've got other servants. And then at the end, even more servants. I think it's referring to the father and the son as the master of the vineyard and then the servant of the vineyard? Makes a natural uh, way to understand that. And then the servants at the end, I think, are all who are willing to come and help, gather the fruit and nurture and prune and pluck. That's right. (laughs) Well, let's talk about it from Jacob's perspective. From Jacob's perspective, I think he knows the allegory of the olive tree in the writings of Zenos. It starts out by saying, I mean, I've got this prophet Zenos. He spoke of the house of Israel. He's not just speaking like in Genesis to all of God's children. Hearken, O ye house of Israel, hear the words of me, a prophet of the Lord. And like Nephi quoted a prophet, 
Jacob now does the same thing and has a huge chunk of a prophet right in the middle of his text. And notice that there's one tree that is especially important. It's on a relatively high place because other branches will be grafted and taken off and planted in a lower part of the vineyard. So we know that as most olive orchards are, it's on a hillside of some kind, and that promotes the drainage. And it says House of Israel is a tame olive tree. Yep, some are tame, which means that they have been cultivated. They began as a wild tree, but by cutting them and pruning them and cultivating them properly, olive trees became productive and fruitful. Olive trees also live a very long time. And they don't produce fruit for a long time either. That's right. There's a saying, if you want to plant for yourself, plant a grapevine. If you want to plant for your grandchildren, plant an olive. (laughs) Oh, that's great. But the master of the vineyard is introduced um, right from the start. And in verse 4, it says, The master of the vineyard went forth, and he saw that his olive tree began to decay. He said, I'll prune it, I'll dig it, I'll nourish it, and perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches. Now, what's going on there? What does it mean when the the branches, we've got the top branch and the top of the tree is starting to decay? So it's the new growth, I guess, not the old growth? Uh, Well, it may have been beset by bugs. Olive trees are fragile. And for some reason... Maybe it's not getting enough moisture. Uh, The roots have to be carefully balanced. If the top of the tree grows too fast, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it will overpower the roots. And this is all good botanical gardening. Yeah, yeah. And if it starts to get too lofty, it needs to be cut off. Otherwise, it won't produce well. And if it begins to die, it will then rot, and the tree will become infected, and you'll get different disease and problems. I think he's here talking about the fact that our master will need to prune us, and we will need to be nurtured and digged and and cut back and nourished. I, I feel like this is so easy to apply to the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have to actively be participating. And if the Lord wants to correct us or give us some challenges... We trust him because he's the master of the vineyard. What I think we learn here is that this is a symbol that can represent, first of all, the whole house of Israel. Yeah, that's what he says in verse 2. It can also represent us individually. Ah. We may be, like a family, may be one tree because there's an orchard here. And one other little botanical point is that olive trees can't live by themselves. Oh. They have to have Cross-pollination? Exactly. And so Israel, even though you may have a a house of Israel or a tribe of Israel, there have to be these other groups, other trees that are a part of the balancing and the cultivation process. So the tree can represent all of Israel. It can represent one tribe. It can represent an individual as well, because our lives are much the same way. If we become too independent and aren't benefiting from the others. If we have to stay in balance, if uh, if we become too prideful, too lofty, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a problem. So the uh, the vineyard begins by saying we've got a difficult situation here because the best tree, the prize tree, the one that had produced the best fruit, is now, is now going wild. And they prune back and they burn it in verse 7. They're beginning to wither away. They'll cast down them out in the fire. So the clippings um, are going to be destroyed because of this wildness. Uh, Some parts of the tree are going to be burnt. Well, the clippings need to be destroyed, as I understand, because if you just leave them on the ground, they will rot. And that will create decay and uh, mold and other problems that will then damage the roots. And so it's, it's important to keep the, uh, you know, as, as you've gone through olive groves in, the, in Israel, you'll notice that they're kept real clean. Yeah, they are. And uh, that doesn't that happen by accident. <laughs> Lots of leaves fall and they have to go clean these out. So. And interestingly, the, um, the most important part, I think, throughout the whole allegory is described in verse 8 for the first time, where the Lord says that 
he wants this tree to grow so I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. And wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches and I will graft them whithersoever I will. So he's after the fruit. He wants the fruit. He wants this. The branch is important. The tree is important. But what he really wants is the fruit. And all the wonderful uses that that fruit brings. Well, and as we liken that to ourselves, um, the gifts of the Spirit are not for our aggrandizement. They're to bless other people. And, you know, the Lord needs our service to bless. That's why you're the salt of the earth. You're adding flavor to everything else. You know, it's, it's a beautiful imagery as we're looking at it ourselves. And then he, that's why he starts the grafting process. That's verse 9 for the first time. He grafts many times after this. That's right. And that's, that's uh, an interesting point that in order to strengthen an olive tree that is withering, uh, you need to go and find uh, a strong wild branch that you bring in, not because that wild branch is going to produce good fruit, but you graft it in and that wild branch will grow vigorously and it will then strengthen the tree and strengthen the, uh, uh, for a while, will help the roots. Don't you see that with, with the church's growth with converts? I mean, I just absolutely love hearing the testimony, not only of our children, but of our converts. And it strengthens you, and you can see God's hand in the work. And no, I think if grafting is conversion, grafting in the wild ones really does help us. What you see in this allegory is a lot of pruning and caring for and wise management of these trees. A lot of work that goes into it. But God is totally involved in our lives in this allegory. He's not an absentee master. Uh, that's right. He, he knows. He keeps track of what's happening. He does have his servant that goes down and reports back. And this servant has servants. That's an important part here, too, because Running a big vineyard like this is a big enterprise. And for the ancient world, this involved lots and lots of people and teamwork. Verse 17, the Lord of the vineyard looked and behold, the tree in which the wild olive branches had been grafted and it had sprung forth and began to bear fruit and behold that it was good. And the fruit thereof was like that of the natural fruit. You know, so you get this image of, again, the creator is in his element of creating. Well, here he wants to preserve the fruit. That's verse 20. Yep. Take of the fruit thereof and lay it up against the season that it may preserve it unto mine own self. He goes on to this purpose that he has a specific purpose. And people are upset about it in 21. It says, it came to pass that the servant said unto him, how come you're putting you in the poorest part? He says in verse 22, counsel me not. I love that. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. Therefore, I said unto thee, I have nourished it a long time. That's why I told you to work so hard is because I knew the ground wasn't very fertile. But he goes from taking the branch from a good place to a poor place. And then he even goes to a poorer spot of land. And interestingly, just like it is in our lives, sometimes during the hardest times is when we are taken to our knees and our relationship with the Lord and our fruits of the Spirit can be born because we are in a place of need. Um, so I think this is very easy to see the Savior. Here's another tie to Genesis, though. In 29, the servant is talking, and he says, Come, let us go down into the vineyard and see that we may labor again. Does that sound like Genesis language? Yes, and, and the book of Moses even, you know, this idea of, of the creation theme of um, God going back and forth between the spiritual creation and the physical creation. But in, tw in 41 is when we sort of get a change, and it seems like there's not as much hope. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept. So we have a weeping God in the book of Moses. We had Nephi weeping in his pillow at the end of his second book, and we had Jacob weeping for his people earlier, and now we have the Lord of the vineyard weeping. This is a wonderful image that he cares so much. Our God has emotions. He cares. Our Heavenly Father cares about us. And he repeatedly comes and checks on how things are going. And in this parable, you have him doing everything he possibly can do. 
what more could I have done for my vineyard? Is how verse 41 ends. Yeah, I have done everything. And yet some of you are going wild and they're cumbered and they say there's the fruit's bad. We're going to burn it again. What did we count here? There's something like 11 times we have uh, some fire mentioned. And of course, as just as a practical matter, you have to get rid of the prunings, of course. Uh, but from an emotional and a spiritual perspective, the message there is that when we prune, we also need to be sure to uh, eradicate from our lives things that are going to be destructive. Uh, you, the Lord knows what He has to do here. Cut it here, out and burn it. And it, you know, it may be hard. It may be uh, something that you think is maybe counterproductive to do some of these things. Some of what the Lord is doing here doesn't really seem to make much, much sense, but he, we know that he knows what he's doing. And in our own lives, sometimes we don't think we understand why things are being done the way they are, and yet we soon find that the Lord knows best. And in fact, in verse 50, it reads, Behold, the servant said unto the Lord of the vineyard, Spare it a little longer. So here we have the idea of our Savior pleading our case as our advocate um, to the Father. And the Father might have come to that decision himself. Of course, but it's so good when we can rally around and we're thinking as he thinks, as our Savior does with his Father. The Savior's role, of course, he says, I and my Father are one. It's not like the Savior or the servant is going to be recommending something that he doesn't think the Father will go along with. And so here this parable shows that the servant is clearly in tune with uh, the desires of the Lord of the vineyard. And that's, I think, an important point that I and my Father are one. And in verse 60, we see them working together again with more people. This is actually verse 61. Go to and call servants, it's plural, that we may labor diligently with all our might in the vineyard and that we may prepare the way that I may bring forth again the natural fruit, which natural fruit is good and the most precious above other fruit. Jack, that sounds like Lehi's dream. It sure does. He wants everyone to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, of the fruit of the love of Christ. And then he begins this crescendo for the last time. And he repeats it over and over. It's almost like anticipating something of great joy. He says in verse 71, Go to and labor in the vineyard with all your might. For behold, this is the last time that I shall nourish my vineyard. And what do you make of that? Are we talking about dispensations of the gospel here? If if we begin with kind of the creation account, we've talked about the Genesis language, which is mostly in the early part of the the allegory. When the servant comes down once by himself, when you have a few servants who come, other servants who come, it looks like this is happening kind of in stages. And one of the things that is, is obvious about olive trees, and we've mentioned that they grow very slowly and take a long time, is that this would be a good image for the house of Israel as it will exist for a multi-generational growth and development. The Lord will take whatever time it needs, and it it will need a lot of different people, and there, but there will be a last time. Yeah. Oh, and that last time is going to be a time of joy. In verse 71, if ye labor with all your might, with me, ye shall have joy in the fruit, which I shall lay up for myself. And then we hear last time mentioned over and over again. But it's interesting. You have to labor, he says, with by obeying the commandments. So we aren't just in there um, to do it our way. You know, we've got to do it the Lord's way. And that's a good point because, again, just thinking practically about this, you can't just send people out into the vineyard and say, well, go do whatever you think will help. Uh, You do have the master, the Lord of the vineyard, who knows all of his trees. He's old. He's been there before. 
He knows what to do to create the best result. And sometimes it means grafting things down into the nethermost part of the vineyard, where where people say, why are we doing this? But the Lord of the vineyard knows. And then it takes time and generations. And then finally, the fruit will be born. The whole idea of God being a gardener, where it takes time to bear fruit, is a better image, I think, um, than a Superman who flies in to solve the problem. You know, he is trying to nurture us to become um, like him. And that's just what we see here. We're, we're nurturing. But the parable ends, or the allegory ends, um, not just with the joyous fruit and that it's being shared with all these servants, but the clippings have to be burned. And it ends with the burning, which sounds to me like at the end of the, the millennium times. You know, this is... Uh, the day of judgment as well. Once the fruit is ready, once the fruit is gathered, and it that goes along with the book of Revelation, the second coming can come as soon as the bride is ready. And here, as soon as the fruit is prepared, then we can have the burning and the pr- fruit has to be preserved. It has to be saved. It has to be used. I think of it also as the anointing has to have occurred because of the olive oils. This is one season that has ended It doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the world, because this will probably repeat itself in the next season or decade. Or life of this vineyard. Yeah. Yeah. It could be the life of the world. It could be worlds without number. Or worlds. That's exactly right where I was going with worlds without end. And the Lord knows how to uh, produce the best result for all of us. And And we have to trust him. As the vineyard is harvested, where the full harvest has been uh, gathered in. And it's interesting how the harvest takes place. You know, you put big nets underneath the olive trees. Smack them down. And you shake yeah. the trees. Yeah. And, yeah. and down come the fruits and, and so on. But it's important at the end of each uh, season to cut the tree way back, to prune it heavily, because the next year, it will then grow vigorously, and it's on the new branches that you will get the best fruit. Well, Jacob then describes what he wants his people to learn from chapter 5, or the allegory, in chapter 6. Of course, Jacob didn't have these chapters, but um, I appreciate in chapter 6 that he ties it again back to the atonement of Jesus Christ again, because he's talking about the mercy of the Lord. In verse 5, he says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech you in the words of a soberness that ye would repent and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. And while his arm of mercy is extended towards you in the light of the day, harden not your heart. You know, he's using the whole allegory to say, come unto Christ and be cleansed through his atonement. And be patient. And be patient with yourself. And <laughs> and I think be interested in the generations that will come later. Yes. It's not about what's best for me now in my life. It's about... We have to have the house of Israel, the covenant people in order for the Lord's purposes to be accomplished, that as many of his children can come and obtain a physical body as possible. And I think the allegory uh, is a beautiful way of showing how concerned the master, the Lord of the vineyard is, and how wise he is. Like you say here, we should not be impatient But we must know that he remembers his house of Israel, both roots and branches, and stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long. And in this case, they're merciful hands. In verse 4, it says, merciful is our God. And then over in verse 8, he says, will you reject these words? Will you reject the words of the prophets? And will you reject all the words which have been spoken concerning Christ after so many have spoken concerning him and deny the good word of Christ and the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost and quenches the spirit and make it a mock and a great plan of redemption, which hath been laid out for you? You know, I just think he's begging his his readers, his community, his 
multiple audiences, because I'm one of them, um, don't throw away what you have, this treasure here. When he asks them, will ye reject the words? No, they might have been scratching their heads, the audience here, really wondering, what's he talking about? And maybe some of our readers, we've just scratched the surface here on <laughs> yeah. how we aren't, we aren't good at raising olive trees. So some of this stuff doesn't sound very familiar to us. But to people who know how to raise olive trees, this allegory makes absolutely perfect sense. But to, to Jacob's audience, when he says, will you reject this? He may be expecting them to say, we don't get this. What's happening here? And so he has to reassure them. That, look, to get to heaven, you don't need to know how to raise good olives, but you do need to know about the Lord's love, about the atonement, about the repentance and cleansing process. And he's called them to repentance in one of his sermons at the temple that we have now in chapter 2 and 3. And, and let me say, I like the fact that they would have known and understood that the olive tree takes a long, long time to grow. And that you are really, as I've said, preparing, you're, you're planting and working for future generations. And what did Jacob want more than anything else back in Jacob chapter 2? You know, he wants people to have families and to build a, a, strong, a righteous a strong, society. righteous family. A Zion society, yeah. That, and he does need to encourage them. Don't reject it. I love in verse 9. Know ye not that if ye will do these things, that the power of the redemption and the resurrection, which is in Christ, will bring you to stand with shame and awful guilt before the bar of God. He, he, he's saying, I don't want you to go through endless torment. And then in 11, he's saying, repent. And then he ends with, oh, be wise. And what can more can I say? Finally, I bid you farewell until I meet you at the pleasing bar of God. And it sounds as if that were a sermon, and then we have a later message in chapter 7. But maybe he thought he was going to finish writing here because he ends with, amen. And then a few years later, he says, well, well some, some time, uh, some years have passed. Yeah. Chapter 7 is sometime much later. Yeah. So he, he kind of thinks, okay, I've done what Nephi told me to do. And he ends like Nephi did. Nephi said, I'm going to see you at the pleasing bar of God. And now— so That James does sound like a very final yeah. word. But, but he needs he to attach— longer. He needs to attach that appendix, that final episode in his life, which is really very important. Many years have passed, it sounds like, or some years have passed, and a fellow named Sherem is trying to find Enos. Now, if it were just the descendants of um, these seven or four or five tribes that were part of the Nephites, I don't think he would be able to say... I've been trying really hard to find you. But he says, I've been really trying hard to find you. <laughs> um, so I really think they are a much larger civilization now because they've intermarried with other people or made treaties with other people. It sounds as if Sherem does not think the law of Moses points to Jesus Christ. And Jacob wants to defend himself to say the law of Moses does point to Jesus Christ. And so Sherem comes along and it says that Sherem is really good at speaking. That's verse 4. Perfect knowledge of the language. He uses a lot of flattery, it says. Could fit into some of our antichrists in our world right now. But he is pretty mad at Jacob. Well, wherever Sherem comes from, he raises three accusations against Jacob yeah. that can be understood just as general uh, things that are troubling to Sherem. But if you look at them carefully, in their cultural context— He's actually bringing up three things that would have been crimes oh. under their law. I think you're talking about Jacob 7-7. Seven, seven. He accuses Jacob of leading away many people, that they pervert the right way of God. Uh -huh. This is a way of saying you have led people into apostasy. And that's against the law of Moses. It is. Deuteronomy chapter 13, the whole chapter talks about prophets and other people who might try to lead people in Israel to worship in some other way or to pervert the way of the Lord. So he's using 
the law of Moses to attack Jacob. And Jacob earlier in his first sermon in chapter two that we read last week said, you have misunderstood the scriptures and you're quoting them wrong. And here we have an example of that. Verse seven also gives a couple of other points. Well, he says, you keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way. We don't know exactly what it was that Sherem would have produced as evidence that Jacob had done that. But that's a serious uh, allegation. Now, so we do know the Nephites did keep the law of Moses. We saw lots of examples. And they make big points of that. But they may not have kept all of the law of Moses exactly the way it was done in, in under some readings of the law. And what they do say, and Nephi had said, that the law of Moses just points you to Christ. They are emphasizing Christ in a way that might be thought of as marginalizing parts of the law of Moses. And you can see he says what he thinks this amounts to next. They, that he thinks that Jacob has converted the law of Moses into the worship of a being, which he says shall come many hundred years hence. So giving priority to the worship of Christ, even though he hasn't come, seems to maybe have taken some precedence, some importance. I think you're referring back to Jacob chapter 4, verse 5, when he talks about we live the law of Moses for the intent to point our souls to Christ. Now, Sherem is coming and saying, you're leading us to a being that we don't think is actually um, part of the law of Moses. I can see how that sermon and his stories about that and explanations are now being attacked. Now, there's another thing. If you are going to be worshiping instead of the old Jehovah who appeared to Moses, but now looking forward to Christ, maybe not understanding that the two are the same, uh, Sherem now says that this is blasphemy. And so that's the second thing. The, the idea of blasphemy can mean several different things. One is misusing or speaking the name of God improperly or not giving God as much power as he should be given. And maybe by preaching of the Messiah, preaching of Christ, you are now diminishing. Which is exactly what the time of the New Testament was interpreting our Savior's arrival. That's right. And it, But if you say that Jesus is Jehovah— That was blasphemy to the Pharisaic. Now you're saying that he will have to die and he will suffer and do all of those things. Yeah. You, you might think unbecoming. So, so Sherem, And finally, right. finally, Sherem says— that no man can know these things that you're talking about, Jacob, for he cannot tell of such things of things to come. So what he's now accusing Sh Jacob of is prophesying falsely and being a false prophet. That's huge. You can be stoned for that. That's right. And uh, again, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, we have a law that talks about if you prophesy falsely, and if the thing that you prophesy doesn't come to pass, then the prophet shall be stoned. And Sherem's logic here, I think, is, well, if you prophesy about something that's going to happen in 500 years, how can we know whether it's going to come to pass or not? But what you're saying is Sherem is attacking him legally, saying your life's at stake because you are leading this people astray. So Sherem is making a legal statement against the prophet Jacob. Well, whether he's actually bringing a lawsuit or not, we don't know because it doesn't get to that point. But he's certainly raising arguments that sound aggressive. But Jacob and answers those arguments. And how does Jacob answer? I think it's just a few verses later. Verse 9, deniest thou the Christ who shall come? And then he pushes back, do you believe the scriptures? And then he argues that you don't understand the scriptures. And then it came to pass that Sherem says, if you think this is the way things should be, then show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost in which you know so much. Jacob resists that. Yeah, you don't tempt God. Don't tempt God. That's 14. And he says, however, if God will smite thee, let that be a sign unto thee. That's right. So now what happens in a lot of ancient uh, legal matters uh -huh. where you end up like they have now at a kind of uh, deadlock? 
Uh, Jacob has given his reasons. Sherem has given his. The the issues are clearly on the table. Uh And and we don't have a judge here. It's not like there's an actual courtroom that's been uh, uh, convened to handle this. But what would happen normally at this stage in a in a court is that the accuser would be asked to go through what is called an ordeal and the the accuser in order to validate his accusation would need to submit to something like the river ordeal in Mesopotamia where they take you and throw you in the river and if you drowned you were a false accuser and if you were able to be, then you were you lived, then yeah. you were the, the gods, truth. the river god anyway, yeah. is uh, supporting you. And there are other ways in which ordeals like that uh, could be undertaken. Once the next stage, once you have been asked to, uh, okay, you have brought this accusation, you now need to validate this by getting uh, oracular support for your allegations. The accuser has a choice. The accuser can say, I withdraw. Or the accuser can say, lay it on me. Jacob is not going to lay withdraw. But what happens in the meantime is that Sherem is smitten. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He fell down and a few days later he dies. We don't know what happened to him. But for many days they had to nourish him. This is verse 15. In order to just keep him alive, he has... We don't know who's nourishing him. Someone is. Maybe Jacob is nourishing him, hoping that by bringing him back to life uh, or to health, Jacob will be able to convert Sherem and bring peace. He finally does come back uh, and says, gather people together. I want to speak to everybody. And at that point, Jacob probably didn't know, well, what's he going to say? Uh, But Jacob says, fine, I will let you speak. And the multitude comes, and he spoke spoke plainly. It says that he gathers all the people and confesses that Christ was there. That's in verse 17. Well, and the other reason why this is powerful to me is when he does speak here in verse 19, it's formulated in a chiastic structure. So you know this was intentional and you can tell exactly what he's trying to say. And go back to the very beginning of the chapter for just a minute. Okay. What do we know about Sherem? Not much. Oh, it says he was g- talented with language, with speaking. He knew his language. Exactly. He's a good English major or whatever they were speaking in those days. <laughs> He spoke many flattering things unto the people. And so we know that he is, in verse 4, he was learned. He had a perfect language, knowledge of the language of the people and could use much flattery and power of speech. So in his confession, yes. we know that Sherem was good at speaking. Now, why would Sherem, he, he knows now that he was wrong. And he hopes, he says, I fear that my case will be awful. So I confess to God. And he has given this confession in the most eloquent and uh, appropriate way to give his best effort to try to make things better for his eternal soul. So I think that uh, this is a wonderful chapter and you wonder why would Jacob have included this? Well, this is now justifying his whole mission, right? Because the Lord is showing that he is a true prophet because he is living. That's a nice way to end, isn't it? (laughs) Jacob, Jacob needs to tell this story. There were people who were pushing back against what he had said. And whoever Sherem was and wherever he's come from, we don't know. But this was obviously the most serious challenge, and Jacob and the Lord met it. And so for for Jacob to validate his, you know, the fact that he won isn't what Jacob says. He's very humble, very self-deprecating, and God has helped him and delivered him. What this chapter does is it sets a model for future generations. 
in dealing with people who will come and will argue against the gospel that's being preached. Uh, we, we will have Nahor. We will have Korahor. Future antichrists. And those cases are all very different. The facts are different. The legal problems are different. The way they proceed, the way they turn out are, are different. Sherem's case, though, becomes for the faithful a very strong uh, vindication that the Lord has protected Jacob even against the, the most articulate advocate and opponent that you can imagine. And Jacob continues talking about other trials. In verse 25, the people of Nephi did fortify against them, meaning their enemies, with their arms and with all their might, trusting in the Lord, the rock of their salvation. I love this. They're fortifying themselves not just with their arms, but they're fortifying themselves with their faith in the salvation of the Lord. And then it's just this sad, sad ending in verse 26. The time passed away with us, and also our lives passed away, like as if it were unto us a dream, we being a lonesome and solemn people, wanderers cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation. We get a little autobiographical touch here. And in the wilderness and hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions. Wherefore, we did mourn out our days. And I saw that I'm going to die. And so I give my plates to Enos. And he ends just like Nephi did with this beautiful um, passing down the plates. So we mentioned last time the last words and the importance yes. of the last words. And, and I, I think that uh, even though Jacob was happy that he had won this little encounter with Sherem, uh, obviously that didn't solve all the problems. But still, it was a clear indication that God was on their side. But I've done what I was told to do, what Nephi had commanded me, and he promised obedience unto the commands which sounds like Nephi, does it not? I will go and do. <laughs> and then he just says, how does he end? I make an end of my writing upon these plates. And to the reader, I bid farewell, hoping that many of my brethren may read my words. Brethren, they do, yeah. Oh, you can feel for Jacob. Oh, you can feel for him. He's such a human prophet, such a tender person. Oh, yes. May we all search the scriptures daily, daily feast on these words so that we can feast on the love of Christ as Jacob encourages us. Because the love of Christ is the greatest of all the fruits, and we receive it through repentance and revealing the forgiveness of our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Amen.